way to resolve those conflicts. And, next point, our relative equality to one another means that we are vulnerable to one another. In those potential physical confrontations, we have a serious risk of losing what's most important to us, failing to satisfy our strongest desire to stay alive. And this knowledge means that to protect ourselves, and, sorry, and we know all of this, we can figure this all out. And this knowledge means that in order to best satisfy our strongest desires, mostly to stay alive, we should attack immediately in order to preempt the potential conflict that is so risky to us. Okay, so that's the basic structure of the argument. And notice, nowhere did I assume that we're all mm, nasty or mean or out to get other people. I didn't assume that we are all concerned simply with our glory or with domination of others. Some might be, that just adds to the instability. But Hobbes doesn't need to assume that we are all uh, unreasonably um, concerned with dominating others. That's not the main source of conflict. It really is the logic of uncertainty, no resolution, and vulnerability. Okay, and so last point as a kind of review. Um, although I've been stressing that in the typical case where we both, you and I, desire the same thing, really that's hiding a conflict. Because strictly speaking, what I desire, what I take to be good, is that I get the thing. And what you desire, what you take to be good, to be good is that you get the thing. Those are different. And in fact, if they're scarcity, they're incompatible. However, there's one point at which Hobbes argues we really will be in agreement about what is good, the same thing. What's that? Hmm? That, oh, the, about a point in the third person. That's further down the line. Just in terms of our evaluation, once we understand the situation here, once we understand that the state of nature will be a state of war of all against all, and that life there will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, well, we can all form a shared judgment about a certain thing. Yeah. We don't want to be in a state of nature. That none of us wants to be in that condition. That's bad for each of us. Notice that uh, there's a kind of instrumental reasoning going on. We can rationally judge the state of nature to be bad because in that condition, we're not going to be effectively able to satisfy any of our important desires, none of us. So we can all reason instrumentally that this condition is a poor condition to, from which to bring about the satisfaction of our of course, for me, I, so I have an aversion to this. That is, I judge it to be bad. You have an aversion to it also. So we both judge it to be bad. In this case, it really is the same thing that we're judging to be bad. Notice, though, for somewhat different reasons. The reason I judge it to be bad is because I can't satisfy my desires. You don't care about my satisfying my desires, you care about satisfying your desires. But you can't satisfy your desires there either. So you judge it to be bad for that reason. Okay, questions about that? So like I said, uh, there's a sense in which the rest of the story is going to be how to get out of this condition that we all rationally judged to be bad. So we all 
rationally judged to be not conducive to satisfying whatever desires we have in the heart. Okay, so the state of nature, the state of war, all can solve. We were then talking about two objections that Hobbes imagines people making. The first says, no, 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 Hobbes, human nature is good. People wouldn't be that way. Right? And you remember Hobbes says, but look at how actually people behave even in society. It would be even worse in the state of nature, of course. And then he says the desires are in themselves no sin. So the problem really is not a fault of human nature. The problem is, the source of the problem is the logic of the situation in which there's no rational way to resolve the conflicting judgments in the state of nature. Okay, so that's that's actually where we left off. Questions about that? It's on page 77. Okay, so here comes now, very quickly, another objection to Hobbes. Somebody says, well Hobbes, you've described the state of nature as a state of war, but Paragraph 11, it may peradventure be thought that there was never such a time nor condition of war as this. So somebody says, yeah, but this isn't historically accurate, Hobbes. It, it actually wasn't like that. And he has a very couple very interesting replies. The first is, may peradventure be thought there was never such a time nor condition of war as this. And he says, and I believe it was never generally so over all the world. So Hobbes says, well, yeah, maybe not. But it is like this in some places. So he says, he's conceding that this isn't really supposed to be the way it was 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 years ago. But if you look around, you do see, he says, but there are many places where they live so now. But if you look around, you do see some instances of this. And furthermore, he says, over on page 78, paragraph 12, he says, but though there have never been any time where in particular men were in a condition of war of one against another, yet in all times, kings and persons of sovereign authority, because of their independence, are in continual jealousy, jealousies, and in the state and posture of gladiators, having their weapons pointed and their eyes fixed on one another. That is, their forts, garrisons, and guns upon the frontiers of their kingdoms, and continual spies upon their neighbors, which is a posture of war. So if you look at the international situation, if you think of each state or, or commonwealth or nation, as an individual, well, we can think of them as living in a state of nature with respect to one another. So different <coughs> states, different nations, different commonwealths have their own interests. There's no um, global government. So each one is relying on their own judgment to determine what is, what is good, what's to be pursued. And look at how uh, the international uh, situation is, is characterized. It's not that they're constantly fighting one another, but there is constant <coughs> insecurity. They have weapons and armies at the ready all the time in order to protect themselves. That's what the state of war is. There's no security. So he thinks that we can see a kind of model of his state of nature among individuals by thinking about um, countries. Doesn't considering groups of people as like individual entities kind of make the concept of equality kind of incoherent? That's a good point. So while human beings, he thinks, are in fact relatively equal in strength and vulnerability to one another, no one human being is so much more powerful than all the others that they can ignore their threats. The, the analogous case seems not to be correct in international uh, relations, where there can be, Hobbes would say, there can be artificial persons, not natural persons, 
that are much more powerful than some others. That's right. That's a kind. That's an important asymmetry here, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Well, I was also going to say that does that mean that the only way he thinks that they can achieve like global peace is if we were all under one? Seems to be the logic of that, right? Uh, now maybe things are thrown into uh, some kind of uh, different situation by the asymmetry, the possible asymmetries yeah. of power, that would be something people are thinking about. But, but yes, leaving that aside, the logic of this argument is that global peace would be in everybody's interest, and that would require some kind of global commonwealth. OK. Um, but I want to emphasize now um, that Hobbes really isn't so interested in giving historical evidence for this. I mean, he seems perfectly happy to say, yes, yeah, sometimes it's that way, sometimes it's not. It has been that way, sometimes it has been that way. Uh, and this, this suggests that his real point here is to describe what life would be like or could be like outside of the commonwealth. And that is, he's describing hypothetically what the logic of the situation that he's describing would generate. Um, and so we should think of the state of nature not as a historical proposal, not as historical anthropology, but as an account of a threat, something that is possible for us to fall into more or less at any time. And I don't really do this so often, but now you should be thinking of the historical situation that Hobbes was writing in. A civil war where an established commonwealth really had fallen into a war of maybe not all against all, but the stability and um, uh, security of a commonwealth really had broken down. And so we should be thinking.